industry stakeholders and, and beef and lamb and, and, and a bit of a collaboration which seems to be a key theme for today but they're doing a lot of work in the uh, in the data linking uh, and, and benchmarking um, space so, so I'll, I'll let them uh, enlighten us and um, yeah if we save our questions uh, to, to the end of the presentation and hopefully get some good discussion going. Thank you. Thanks Richard and uh, look, welcome uh, everybody to our presentation uh, this morning. Um, look, uh, we're going to have a dual effort here, so uh, my name is Michael Smith, General Manager RMPP and uh, uh, also presenting today will be Mark Johnson who oversees the Systems and Data Integration Workstream. Um, so we'll, we'll work through our presentation. Uh, as uh, Richard said yesterday, we'll just hold the questions to the end. We're not looking to fill up the entire time with slides, so, so we are wanting to make time for discussion at the end of the presentation. Okay, so our first <coughs> slide here is just really a, a very quick overview um, of uh, RMPP and what it's about. Uh, you'll notice our overall objective at the top uh, is all about uh, driving sustainable productivity um, and um, in the, in the sheep and beef sector and, and therefore dry, driving higher profitability and, and you'll be aware that one doesn't necessarily uh, correlate to the other. Um, the sort of, I suppose, three key areas uh, if you, if you um, boil it all down to, to profit, to driving profit. Um, so you're looking at, at the management and, and the skills surrounding that, you're looking at information and, and what you can bring together to allow you to make decisions, you're looking at the overall farming systems that you're running and the combination of, of those three drive profit uh, out at, at the other end. And then there are six key sort of areas that RMPP is looking at. Uh, we've got people, extension, uh, data and systems, the QA, standardised QA programme, there's a New Zealand story in there, and farm to processor as well. And, and those six uh, work streams are all underpinned uh, by quite a lot of research that we've been doing throughout the country too. In fact, the largest a research program that's ever been undertaken in the red meat sector in New Zealand. So today uh, for our presentation we're just going to focus uh, on the data and systems area and give you an update about a few things going on within there. Mark, I'll hand over to you. So we're going to cover off three areas today. I'm going to talk about the first two and Michael's going to come back and talk to the third. Um, um, first thing I want to look at is um, data linker and I just sort of taking a step back from data linker um, before I start, so I think about data, and we all use data to make decisions, and some of that's in our heads, or we might have in a diary we refer back to, but these have limitations, at least storing stuff in my head does, um, and tends to lead us towards use computer systems, which obviously can store more data and um, have greater analysis or analytical capability. Um, farmers have a lot of data, but equally the industry um, organisations we deal with um, have a lot of data which should, could also be useful. So that's just sort of a little bit of background to it. So we'll go into data linker. Um, data linker has been created to make it easy to share data across the sector. Um, and, and it's not just red meat, um, we're primarily here today talking about that, it's a, it's a joint initiative with, with dairy um, as well. Um, data linker enables uh, people who've got data um, to and, and people who want to use data to, to get together. Someone described to me as a, as a dating service, which I guess you could call it that. Um, but fundamentally, it enables um, data providers um, to uh, let people know what data they have available and what terms and conditions they will, um, you can use that data on um, and, and provide it on data consumers rather to, to, to find out who has got that data available. The key thing probably here to remember is that um, even although the, the provider consumer have, have um, created a handshake, technical handshake if you want, behind the scenes to, to agree to share data, no data is actually transferred until the farmer gives the approval to do so. So if you look at some of the possible um, providers and consumers there, you might have a feed budgeting tool that wants to get carcass information from a processor. Um, they will have set the background behind the scenes that the data can be transferred. But within the feed budgeting um, software tool, the farmer will actually get a little message the first time that the feed budgeting tool wants to pull data and say, hey, uh, we want to get data from processors A and B, are you okay with this? And the farmer would say yes, um, or no, but hopefully yes, um, and, and the data would start flowing. That's a one-time only thing. So it's very important to remember that the, the farmer's data doesn't move until the farmer says yes, it's okay to do so. 
Um, data linker is actually part of a, a, a three-pronged initiative. Um, the two other things that, are, that are relate to this are the New Zealand Farm Data Standards. Uh, and really that's been going for what, two, maybe three years now, um, with a large number of sector players involved and farmers defining some common terminologies for the data that we, um, that we will move around, which is obviously very important that we're all talking about the same thing. The second, or uh, the third thing there is a farm data code of practice, which is it's really an accreditation process and it, um, and it requires organisations to outline the steps they take to safeguard the farmer data. So um, this is to ensure that the data that they hold for farmers is treated securely, safely, they respect the privacy, they have the systems in place to keep it there when you need it and back it up and recover it and so on. So um, those three initiatives are, um, are all um, linked together to, to create this ability to move data around. Uh, this is a very important point, I think, to note that no data actually is stored in Data Linker um, and no data flows through Data Linker. Once the, um, the process of we talked about previously to reach agreement that data can be transferred, it actually moves between the data provider and the data consumer directly. And Data Linker, um, we've created some software that will help bits of plug-in software we can, we've given, we were creating to help people do that. Um, so it's a consistent um, set of data that comes out from each, each provider. But that's a really important thing to remember. Data doesn't go through Data Linker and it's not stored in Data Linker. So the real important bit about this is what, what are the benefits? Um, some of the sort of obvious things are that it reduces dual entry of data. Uh, um, we capture it once and utilize it many times, potentially. Um, increases accuracy because it's not being rekeyed several times. Um, it does provide more ac or access to more data, which is probably really important. Um, and that, that supports the sort of enhanced decision making that Michael was talking about earlier. Um, um, and, it, and one other thing it, it will do is um, we've um, um, we often hear that farmers are requested the same data from multiple organisations. Well, this is a means of um, overcoming that. Um, so that someone somewhere will have that data and it can be shared without the farmer having to actually um, provide it several times. So Data Linker, where, where are we with Data Linker? Well, um, the core product has been developed. Um, and the first two sets of data that we are transferring, which are kill sheet information and, and animal transactions, things that affect your stock rec, we've defined the data sets for those. And we're running a pilot um, very shortly. There are six organizations involved in that. Um, and they are, um, we, we, we anticipate we'll be um, moving some data between those organizations within the next sort of two or three months. Um, once we've done that, um, then we'll be looking to expand this out to a wider group of organisations. And it's fair to say that um, through those three initiatives, there have been, I think, somewhere in excess of 120 organisations involved um, over the last two or three years in the data standards and code of practice and, and data linker. Um, so there's, a, there's a quite a um, tidal wave, I think, of people um, sitting there waiting to use this and um, recognising the real potential benefits that exist. So the next thing I want to talk about is benchmarking. Um, I, 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 Garth will know, probably, my ex-boss of mine always used to say, um, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it, if you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so I think that's very true, but not everyone's measuring performance, and I think that's fair enough because it takes effort and it requires you know, possibly systems to do that, and you may not feel there's a benefit, or you can't, you know, you can't enough benefit to do so. Um, so it becomes a bit circular. If you can't do it, you can't see the benefit, so you don't do it. Um, so, um, why are we doing it? Well, we want to create some awareness around the potential to measure, um, just to um, stimulate some interest and, and perhaps, you know, create some desire to try some new things on farm or so, some minor tweaks, enhancements in the farm system to see if we can do something a bit, a bit differently. Um, we're only creating a handful of these benchmarks. Uh, it's just to, get, to help to get people, people sort of kick-started on measuring. These will be um, available through uh, another um, initiative we've got going through in our MPP, which is to create a, an online resource for the red meat sector. Um, and we will, we'll be doing some piloting um, um, later this year with the, some pilot farms that we've got in other sectors, in other, other project streams. Um, and once we've got that sort of proven, we'll be hoping to roll this out in general availability early next year, sort of first quarter next year with a bit of luck. Um, the key with these things is there's no data entry or very limited data entry required by farmers to get these benchmarks because we're going to pull this information that you need to, to, to populate these benchmarks through Data Linker. 
Um, I'll talk about the, the, the load of data entry you need to do in one place later. Um, so, um, what are we comparing? Well, we'll, we'll not every um, benchmark lends itself to each of these, but some will do compare year on year, some will do cumulative through a season, some will be, um, you know, peers. By peers, probably we're talking regional um, rather than your next door neighbour. Um, we're creating some new benchmarks. Uh, and I'll talk in a little more detail about the specifics of those in a minute, but the carcass defects, kgs per hectare, and a live weight gain on a lamb growth rate you might know it as. There are some existing benchmarks on the Beef and Lamb website already in there under their innovative to um, interactive tools. Um, and I don't think they've been um, picked up or used greatly, so we'll probably just re-promote re those to some extent through, through that portal I talked about earlier. Um, we haven't just sort of pulled our, these out of the thin air. Um, what the benchmarks we're doing are based on research and farmer feedback, and quite extensive research and farmer feedback we've done on areas that are regarded as um, key um, useful measures to, to undertake as in the, in the starting point. So looking specifically at these now, these are models at this stage. Um, the content may change to some extent. The look and feel of them, the color will almost definitely change the layout, so don't get too hung up on what they look like. But the, the key things to look here are what we're doing with carcass defects is, and I say the, the information will come through from through data linker from processors. We're going to um, show the top incidence of defects that um, are occurring, and these are on-farm um, defects, obviously. Um, and what, we're, what we really want to do is to, to show the loss of income that relates to these defects. Um, and we've got a bit of work to do just to work out how to, how to standardise that from processes, but we've, that's in train. Um, and, and that's all well good. You go, well, that's what, that's what I've lost. What can I do about it? And we'll back that up by taking you from there into a number of strategies or resources that you can use to try and um, remedy the problem. Now, obviously, if some of them are very difficult to do, um, to fix, or there might be longer term fixes, but we will still try and provide you with all the information through that portal um, on how to fix these things. The second one is kilograms per hectare. Again, this is um, based um, on, well, there's three levels in, in here. Um, the first one is based on kill sheet information, again, through Data Linker, and, and that will just be carcass weight versus the hectares on your farm, and the only thing you need to put in is the number of hectares and we'll calculate this. So if you can see it's year on year, um, cumulative through the season, so you get a very quick picture of, um, you know, almost line by line going through the works of, um, of where you stand in kgs per hectare. There are two additional tiers here, um, and you can, and it does require a little bit of manual entry here, but um, you can put in your um, sort of sales and purchases and wool, and opening and closing stocks to, to, to move up to two levels two and three, which give a little more accuracy around here, but, but not significantly. And I think the trend you can get from this will be um, pretty useful, even just at level one. The final um, car and benchmark we're doing is um, a live weight gain. Again, it's, you can see it's season on season, cumulative through the season, um, and obviously dropping off through the season as you'd expect. Again, this will be from the kill sheet information, line by line, you'll be able to see um, how your, um, what your lamb growth rates are um, each season, each line that goes through. So um, that is um, all I want to say at this stage. I'll hand back to Michael. Okay, finally, uh, looking at EASD, or Electronic Animal Status Declaration. So most of you will be very aware that for all animal movement uh, in New Zealand, uh, it's legislated that the animals must be accompanied by a paper form, and it's been that way for many years. And so uh, as part of the program, what we've actually introduced um, and, and have uh, received a mandate from MPI to do in collaboration with Osprey is to um, actually trial a proof of concept or a POC, uh, as we commonly call it, of an electronic EASD. And so currently uh, we've actually developed that proof of concept. It's purely farm to slaughter at this stage. And uh, right at this minute it's in trial across three processor sites in New Zealand. So we have uh, some farmers out of Greenlee and Hamilton, and we have farmers out of Ansco, Canterbury, and we have farmers out of Progressive and Hastings uh, all now using this system. Uh, to small groups of farmers so we can trial it. 
Um, actually, it's gone quite well, but it's fascinating even though you think you've done all your homework and you absolutely know how this goes. Um, when you uh, build these things and put them into operation, it's funny what little processes pop up that people didn't realise actually existed. So uh, it's been an extremely handy um, uh, proof of concept for us to go through and really understand uh, how this works within the industry. Uh, what we're looking to do, or what we're actually doing at the moment, concurrently alongside that, we're actually working with the wider industry on development of a full business case. So what does a complete EASD look like? At the same time, uh, MPI as the regulator um, are looking at, so, so what does um, having this information in electronic form mean in terms of um, either reg reg further regulation, uh, meeting our market access uh, overseas, overall biosecurity, traceability, etc. as well. So uh, it's prompted a, a far wider process. Uh, overall though, the, the benefits, and, and certainly uh, our farmers using this, um, in fact, uh, when we um, recently uh, put out an Android app, we actually have it now, web-based Android and Apple, but we, we started off with a web-based app and we released the, the Android app just to the, the handful of farmers that were piloting this initially for us. And um, in fact, before we'd even advised them that it was just available for this group of farmers to download, one farmer had already been in, found it, and downloaded it. Um, and not only that, I actually think he went out to the paddock, he sent one bull off to the works, and I'm sure all he wanted to do was use his mobile app to say that he could do it, uh, which was quite funny. So um, uh, what, what we have found though, farmers are definitely finding this a lot easier and a lot simpler to use. Uh, what we're also finding, it's testing some of our processes around um, rather than do it the night before, uh, most of the farmers are actually doing it right at the time and the truck's there. Uh, we have, for example, uh, out of Ansco Canterbury, we also have five star beef using it. Um, and when I was down there recently, the guy was racing out on Friday, they already had brought up the animals that were going to head off to the processor on Sunday. Uh, he was completing his ASD on the, the phone as he was heading down because it meant he didn't need to come back on Sunday to see it out with the truck. The, the processing company already had it, it was done, dusted, uh, the transport could pick them up, it was, it was finished from his point of view. So in terms of efficiency uh, around that was fantastic. The other thing that we are doing with this um, is, is because we are working in conjunction with Osprey, right at the minute uh, the way to log in is through a NAIC login and we're aware not quite every farmer in New Zealand has a NAIC login so, so we will uh, look to, to manage that as well. Um, but uh, because you're using your NAIC login, we actually know uh, where you come from, so we can pre-populate your address, uh, which means that processors don't need to go back and, and request that on a paper form when it currently comes in, maybe not quite filled out, you're on Ryan's Road, but which Ryan's Road? Um, and uh, as a result, can, can identify where these stock uh, likely are, you're able to change that as well but we also know your TB status. So instantly that information flows through um, and rather uh, than see some interesting TB statuses on forms, actually we, we know what it is, it's one less thing a farmer needs to, to worry about. So, so that's the electronic ASD. Um, what I'm actually gonna do now is uh, show you a couple of screens. We're actually gonna cut this out of the recording, I'm afraid there's, there's a little bit of IP around this at the moment, but here today you actually get to see this. So, for example, here's um, our opening screen on um, an Android app. Um, very simple, we've, we actually had, um, as we've been building this, we've put it in what we've called a sand pit and, and let our farmers uh, loose on testing it and providing feedback. And some of the feedback's been fascinating. In fact, it has drastically altered the design uh, of this in order to make it easier and simpler to use. So it's been really good. So nothing too, um, too stunning about that. Uh, at the moment, we can currently, as you see, do cattle and sheep EASDs. And then just uh, a couple of screenshots uh, here um, uh, as, as we're opening up. Um, actually, I can't see it on the screen down here. I think this might be the, the cattle one because it's got the herd um, stuff out to the side. So this is just when you first go in. Uh, obviously, you can put in your, your herd ID that will automatically uh, filter through it knows what other IDs are associated with that which you can choose. Uh, we've actually had a couple of dairy guys involved in this as well and, and they think this is great. Um, and uh, as you can see in, in that shot as well, we've got three processor sites uh, that you can choose from. So um, 
Uh, if you were looking at a sheep one at the moment, you actually wouldn't see Greenlee appear on that list because they don't process sheep. So we can make a lot of those refinements within the tool to make it quicker and easier over time as well. Uh, I think we've got the address details, etc. hidden there. Um, you can pop that open at any time and, uh, and adjust those if need be. The other thing is that you'll see there's little blue question marks there. And at any time, if you're unsure about what a field is, click on that. We'll actually give you the regulation notes that go with that. So currently on your EASD, if you're unsure about anything, turn over to the reverse side and those notes are there. We've printed all this here as well. And, and the final slide is just a, another one looking at a, a sheep ASD. Uh, these sheep are actually going to progressive meats and we've got the, the progressive meats symbol up in the corner there um, of the, the screenshot. Um, and I think that one's expanded out so you, you can see um, uh, some additional details in there and that one you can also see the tally at the bottom so you can actually start to put in some numbers and it will automatically uh, adjust those up for you. Um, by, by doing all of this and making as much of it automated as possible uh, and including the fact that um, uh, you know, we ask about withholding periods on stock, it, it's the standard form that you go through now, it's a legislative form, we can't change those questions in any way but we can be smart about how we ask them. So, so for example, um, you know, have you used uh, HGP or, or hormone growth promoters? Uh, if you say no, then we don't need to ask you when you use them or um, I think a, another adjustment on the form is, uh, are any of these animals imported? If you say no, then we don't need to ask you when did you import them, which at the moment all, is all sitting on a paper form because we've got to have all the questions available. So, so we can be a lot smarter in the way we present the form. So there it ends the, the presentation from, from Mark and myself. Uh, look, we're, we're happy to open it up for, for questions. Thank you, Michael, and, um, and, and Mark, that's a, a good little insight. And um, yeah, we'll leave it to the floor and, and get some discussion going and ask some questions. That's a, a good question. Um, so the, the question was, how long will it take before this is freely available? Uh, look, what we're doing at the moment, we are going through, uh, as I said, a proof of concept and that's got about another month to six weeks to run. Uh, part of that will be quite an evaluation uh, period that, that sits alongside that, um, where, for example, even the regulator MPI need to work through and make sure that this is, is going to um, meet New Zealand's requirements uh, in terms of export. Uh, and there's been a couple of legislative changes to allow these sorts of things to happen as well. So for example, electronic signatures were not accepted um, in terms of signing off uh, for, for export licence either in the past, but, but some of those regulations are now through as well. So um, what we are looking to do is, is starting next month is probably develop uh, a few things a little bit further. There's a few things we've found out as we've gone through the proof of concept and we will then roll that out um, amongst some sites within our processor partners within RMPP. So we have uh, six processor partners, plus FCO have, already, uh, have also come on board as a contributor to this project. So uh, it's quite nice to have um, uh, most of New Zealand's export market actually tied up within this project. Um, at the same time, as I say, we are looking to have the full business case completed for draft by the end of this month. Uh, and we will be then considering how the industry might take this on and develop a full implementation. So um, I suppose if I was really optimistic, I'd love to say that all New Zealand farmers who want to use it will have uh, that opportunity uh, probably within 12 months. Um, but don't quote me on that one. <laughs> yes? Is there any particular tool you were looking at in particular? Or it well, I suppose the, the, the um, ASD forms are, are quite an easy one, or easier, I would have imagined. But the data linker would have a few more challenges, I would expect. Well, I mean, I guess data linker probably isn't 
isn't going to be rolled out directly to farmers. It's mo more going to be the industry organisations who've got data and um, people who've got um, farm management systems who want to share data um, that will be involved in this and the farmer will almost indirectly benefit from that by, by the fact that they utilise those end, end user software systems. Um, so, so I think data link is probably, um, while there'll be um, obviously promotion about it, um, that, that won't require farmers to be involved directly, other than other than saying yes, I can I approve my data to flow, and I assume that, that you know the likes of um, Farmer Q would build um, into their systems that, that that facility say yes, and would also then promote the fact that they were exchanging or able to get data from through data link because there's a benefit to their customers. So. I think that maybe it would almost end up being with the, the software solution providers who will who will be promoting this because there'll be an advantage um, in doing so for themselves. It will be supported by what, what we do. Thanks, Mark. Um, That's all right. No problem. <laughs> so, um, can I answer that question in a moment? I think there's two other um, answers or, or two other parts to your previous question as well because. How do we promote technology within the rural sector uh, is quite key. And, and there's a big issue around that as well, which is very relevant to EASD, which is connectivity in the rural sector. So um, both of those issues we're actually trying to address at the moment. Uh, RMPP is actually doing quite a bit of work and has actually trialled some courses, which are actually going to start rolling out, in fact, uh, even starting this month, um, around uh, computing. And, and we've looked at a, a getting started computing course. So, you know, we've had uh, farmers actually turn up to, to a couple of our trial ones. They've bought a laptop, it's in the box, can we set it up and get it going? And, <clears throat> and we're really happy to start at that level um, and actually help facilitate, um, you know, people just getting on to computers and using the basics and technology. So a core underlying factor of likes of the benchmarks that we're looking at, we are trying to absolutely minimise the amount of input that, that people need to provide to make it as easy as possible for people to actually start using this. The other thing is, that with the connectivity, in fact, we're, we were talking with a major telco at the moment, is there a way that potentially we could boost connectivity, even if it be briefly, while a stock truck is sitting in a yard picking up stock? So are there ways that we could uh, try, you know, whether it be a box sitting on a, a stock truck, whereby we can grab a data feed, uh, potentially could we satellite Wi-Fi, et cetera, whatever, to, to try and get that information and make sure that everything is done on time. So, so there's a, another couple of parts, if I could just add that. In terms of this, um, does data link use EASD? Uh, possibly in some form at all, because there's quite a bit of data obviously sits in here that's relevant. The, the thing is that, uh, well, uh, obviously ourselves, uh, our MPP, uh, along with Osprey and, and MPI have been involved in building this. Th this potentially can sit behind other farm systems that are already available. So, so for example, if another farm system wants to say, well, half a minute, um, I'm happy, you know, if you're working through your farm system saying, I'm going to send X number of cattle or whatever to uh, the processor tomorrow, then actually that data could be pre-populated to uh, the EASD sitting behind the scenes. There'll still be the declaration part of this where you do have to declare it, it is a legislative form, but we can automatically fire you back to the, the farm system or program you're using again to carry on. So um, the, the data will be readily available to move around within the, the farmer and the farm system packages. Can I just add to that? Go on, second question again as well, sorry, tag team. Um, the, well, we're talking obviously data and systems here. This is, these aren't the only um, streams of activity that are occurring. So these will be supported by extension activities. So we won't just sort of stick these things up on a website and hope find, people find them. Um, you know, we want to look at, and um, we are looking at how you wrap extension around these tools as well. So there'll be communication, people actually talking about it in the sector. Um, you know, so um, they're not in isolation, which I think is important to remember as well. Anyone else? I've got one question, um, probably more Mark. Um, the, the benchmarking, uh, is there room for customization of, of uh, or the, the different KPIs for different farmers and, and things to, uh, um, in that space? Uh, we're not really going there. We're trying to provide a real, you know, a, 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 a small set that stimulate interest and awareness and get people going for people who are not really doing this. 
And, and really the idea is then that if, if you then start using those tools and you go, well, that's great, but it's not doing what I want it to do, is you, you move on to a commercial product probably that's delivering those sort of, that sort of level of capability. Yeah. Cool. Ben, is there anything else that you're firing people have got in development? Systems and data space. Yeah, yeah. 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 You touched on the portal. portal. Yeah. Um, that's. I mean, the, the the portal is just. I mean, it's a, we we want to create a, a new online resource. Um, we want to try and do that a bit differently. There's lots of good information sites out there. Um, but they're not necessarily used, it's not necessarily easy to find the data, we want to try and deliver that in a different, innovative way, use mobile technology to push, push information out rather than you having to go and find it, it comes out to you based on what your specific um, region is or your types of animals you farm or what your, your preferences you might set. So we're trying to make, drive that to a, a more sort of user friendly um, mechanism for getting information to you that's relevant to you. So that's probably the other one big thing that's happening. There's probably there's, there's two others um, that I've mentioned within the stream, and, and I actually used to run this work stream before um, Mark came on board, so it's still quite close to my heart, I suppose. Um, but uh, a couple of other areas that we are looking at uh, out of interest, one is rapid group weighing. So, so can we set something in a gateway in time where you can run a mob of whatever uh, across it and, and come up with potentially some individual weights? Um, or, or even at this stage, some average weight. So, so if you uh, run a mob of lambs, say, into a paddock, can you grab an average weight on the way in, and a few days later, when you bring them out again, can you again have this in a gateway um, and grab an average weight coming out, which A, tells you, firstly, are your lambs growing, and secondly, uh, if you're starting to take a few um, pasture numbers and understanding residuals and what have you of cover, then uh, you start to get an idea of paddock performance. Um, so that would be one other thing we're, we're researching at the moment, doing quite a bit of research in that space. Um, and another one is actually, uh, this is a bit more obscure, but looking at pelt ID. So is there a way that we can um, track the pelt of an animal uh, through a processor and align that uh, um, once it's been through the, the pickle stage back to a farmer? So at the moment, once your pelts come off a sheep, uh, they disappear down the hole, and, and you'll get a, um, uh, a, a payment based on, on what was seen, I suppose, at the time coming in. But, but once it's gone through the pickle stage, we actually don't know who owns the <coughs> pelt in any way, shape or form. So um, that, it sounds a bit of an odd one, but actually if we can identify or mark or whatever our pelt uh, that goes through what is an extremely rigorous physical process and then a um, highly toxic chemical process and still identify it when it comes out, um, th there's huge other applications within the food industry for, for potentially identifying products, uh, byproducts as they go through the system. So that's just something else that's quietly happening, um, some research on the side. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we must be getting close to lunch, so um, so yeah, I'll just uh, on behalf of the room, I'd like uh, everyone to show their appreciation for, for Mike and Mark. And, um, I have a couple of bottle of wine, bottles of wine there, so I'll, I'll, I'll hand them over in, in, in a second, but, um, but yeah, thank you.